Hello, everybody. I guess let me start by sharing my screen here properly. Okay, maybe a little bit of background on myself first before I jump into um, Aventus itself. So as mentioned there, I did my uh, uh, my undergrad and master's at Imperial um, with a degree in computer science and artificial intelligence. That was in 2015. My thesis was with, with Will, with um, uh, Will who heads up the, the Crypto Center for Imperial, looking at film rights distribution on the blockchain. Uh, the last time I spoke here, we spoke about where Aventus started, which was in the ticketing industry. So we had a look at gone from the, the thesis on film, moved into music and specifically recorded music. And we saw an opportunity there around how the secondary market uh, works, uh, specifically referred to as scalping in the States or touting um, in the UK, um, secondary market dynamics of ticketing. So that we started building that out as a business. We went for a fundraise uh, 2016, 2017. We ended up raising about a total of $50 million. Um, and we used that to build out our ecosystem. So it uh, started, we ended up doing a deal with Live Nation, which is one of the biggest people in the ticketing sector, various smaller players within that sector. But ultimately, 2019-20, around sort of COVID time, as you can imagine, ticketing wasn't a, wasn't a high growth sector. So we had significant treasury from the money we had raised, and we looked at how we can diversify Aventus. So that's what I'll be pitching to you here today, giving you an insight into and some of the use cases we have kind of come across since then uh, on our journey. So Aventus in a nutshell is a blockchain, a blockchain that we've really focused on the user experience and the sort of interoperable uh, nature thereof, everything that an enterprise really needs to adopt blockchain properly. So before I get into that, let's do a little bit of uh, a bit of history of how the internet has evolved. Um, and I'll do a bit more around definitions on blockchain just so that we're all reasoning from the same set of assumptions. So as the internet rolled out, we saw in the early days, for those that aren't familiar with the rollout, the internet started as what's called intranets, right? This was a network between academic institutions or military networks, a closed off network where these parties could kind of chat to each other and exchange data, but nobody else had access to it. It created these silos of value that the internet then came along and kind of disrupted by connecting everything together. Um, and that's really very similar to what we're seeing in the blockchain industry right now. So the internet evolved from web one, which was really <coughs> data stored on servers, and people being able to access that data, right? The, the transfer of data. The evolution then to web two, which was kind of post.com bubble around 2000s, was the innovation of user-generated content. It was not just reading what was in servers, it was actually creating your own content. And this is where social media was really born. User-generated content and all the interactions and the dynamic um, sort of evolution of the internet. And then Web3 has come along, I'd say probably Bitcoin pioneered this in 2008, 2009, where we now have the ability to represent value digitally without an intermediary, right? If you think of blockchain, the real innovation that we have here is digital scarcity without an intermediary governing that. That is the, the, the real innovation. And the scarcity, you can represent value. And once you have value, which we have as tokens in the blockchain space, you can start playing with the, the issuance, the supply side management of that token um, around certain actions that occur in a digital context. And this is how you sort of align people's economic incentives around a particular objective. So Bitcoin was the first of that. Now in Web3, we've kind of gone across three generations of blockchain. So in 2009, Bitcoin launched and it launched the era of, should we say, medium of exchange. These are tokens that you could represent value. They were issued in line with certain guidelines um, and you could kind of move them around between different participants. The second generation, which launched in 2015 when I did my thesis, what, what Will really got me into um, is what's called smart contracts. So smart contracts essentially allow you to do more than just exchange value. They allow more general purpose blockchain applications. So if you think of 
Bitcoin as a calculator, so of specific purpose, and a computer as general purpose, right? You can have a calculator on a computer, but you can also do Photoshop or email or whatever. There's, there's many different purposes you can program into a computer, whereas Bitcoin, you can really just transfer value. And now the third generation, which was launched around 2019, pioneered by Polkadot, which is what I would call the internet of blockchains. We've seen the siloed value start to create people saying, oh, Bitcoin's the best, or Ethereum's the best, or uh, whatever, Cardano is the best. But ultimately, the user doesn't care at the end of the day. When you Google something, you don't care what database they use. You want your results quickly, right? And that same thing is emerging now with blockchain. It doesn't matter what blockchain, you want to connect them all up. And that's the sort of concept of internet of blockchain that since 2019, we have been highly involved in sort of fleshing out. So Aventus then, uh, it's an enterprise grade blockchain. By this we mean it has all of the bells and whistles needed for a serious business like Live Nation or various other sort of enterprise clients we have had or continue to pursue. Um, need to kind of integrate this within their stacks. It's all the boring stuff, but the important stuff around corporate due diligence, around legal um, and compliance, around processes, key management, all of the stuff that makes sure applications are safe um, and usable by users at the end of the day at scale. That's what we have focused on. Also a very important component of this is, um, I obviously mentioned the interoperability point. But the scalability, so blockchains inherently, for those of you who've been following recently, Ethereum, the second biggest blockchain, has just moved to a more scalable infrastructure called Ethereum 2.0. And with that comes more climate friendly. Obviously, Bitcoin, I think we were chatting before this, is consuming the energy of, of countries, right? So it's about how can you do use this technology in a more sustainable manner. The key problems we are addressing, I've mentioned the first one already, sort of siloed blockchain value, connecting all of that up. And then you have user and developer experience. Now, this has emerged for various reasons. We've seen the token hype of 2017, should we say, where a lot of consumers got damaged because there were a lot of scam projects. I'd say 95 to 99% of the projects there are not standing anymore today. They either had to return funds or they ended up in legal trouble this in a major way. We've seen recently NFTs, if people have come across that, essentially digital artworks, collectibles, where there's been another big sort of boom in that. But many of these are people getting excited before the fundamental technology has been built. Now, what that means is it pushes up market caps because regulation is not in place yet to properly protect the consumer. That leads to a situation where people can get damaged because they don't know how to differentiate market participants. So there's been bad reputation or negative sentiment by some in market around where does blockchain actually fit? How do I differentiate a real product from not a real product? And then there's a, what we refer to as sort of a bedroom developer mentality in blockchain. There's been about $1.5 billion in hacks in blockchain this year so far. Most of those are because basic security protocols haven't been followed. You get these blockchains with enterprise level market caps of $10 billion, and these networks halt in production frequently because the core infrastructures in their disaster recovery hasn't been taken care of. So all of that is slowing down the adoption of blockchain itself in the areas where this technology can really add value. So the solution, how we're going about approaching these problems, right, is across these four buckets. So I already mentioned enterprise grade. The Aventus Networks processed over 22 million transactions since we reached production last February. There are over 2 million active wallets. All of this has the kind of governance um, and, and the APIs, the infrastructure you would expect on top of that. It's interoperable. You want to connect up these blockchains. You want to make this value seamlessly transfer across different networks. So we have a connection of over 50 of the biggest blockchains so far that can all now talk to each other um, in, in the sort of best standards of, of bridging, this is called at the moment. Sustainability, we're officially carbon neutral. Make sure that the network is designed as efficient as possible and offset any of that in, uh, remaining energy usage that exists. And finally, it's this sort of scalability point, right? 
we do 2,000 transactions per second and confirm this very quickly at a low price, an average of one cents a transaction. So these are key things that are getting rid of the blockers to adoption of blockchain itself. So I'm not going to bore you too much with the detail of what user and developer experience means. There's just different key aspects that are required in the ecosystem, right? A block explorer essentially gives transparency into the activity that is occurring on a blockchain. Wallets, which give you a user-friendly way to manage keys and access this value. And then what we call the gateway API, which is ways businesses can build on this with the kind of features that they would expect from an enterprise solution. Now, I think I've, I've, I've made clear in the previous slides why blockchain can be useful for business. I think it was Ernst & Young I read, what, um, they, they kind of quite nicely explained what ERP systems did for sort of internal business processes, blockchain can do for processes across businesses. So it's really when there are multiple parties interacting with each other around some value source, whether it's the properties of immutability that blockchains have that can be useful, that's provenance use cases, whether it's um, the value exchange, uh, potentially even into sort of financial applications, debt instruments and whatnot, there's all sorts of different applications where there are low trust environments of parties and transacting with each other, where blockchains can kind of add value there. Now, most of this I've already covered, but our use cases span the following, and, and I'm going to focus on this after we get through the next couple of slides, because I think this is where it's the, the most interesting to you. Where can this actually add value today? What use cases, right? So event ticketing, I already mentioned, because that's obviously where event has started, but we've moved from that into sort of video games, royalty models, aviation most recently, um, non-fungible tokens, which, which I'll get to properly later, and blockchain as a service, essentially helping enterprise deploy this own infrastructure within their ecosystem. Now, our blockchain has a token that kind of aligns the economic incentives. What we have um, blockchain-wise is what's called a proof-of-stake network. So essentially, you're just talking about how the network agrees on the state of the transactions, right? You, the, the participants in the network need to agree consensus around what that stake is, and you align those economic those economic incentives of the consensus achieving parties through a token. So anybody who says I'm going to process transactions has to put up a stake in tokens. This stake can be removed from them if they seem to be fraudulent. It acts as an economic deterrent to fraud. And anybody who wants to process a transaction in these networks pays in a token. Um, so staking, that's that process of putting up collateral, saying, I will be honest, um, which can be removed from individuals. And then governance. These networks are decentralized. They're open source. They're decentralized. We develop it. We release it. And from there, it's in the hands of the community. So the Aventus network itself, the major decisions in the network, like anybody who saw the move from Ethereum 1 to Ethereum 2, you have your token holders vote. One token equals one vote, and they essentially govern in a sort of democratic way the future of the network. Now, I've mentioned actually Imperial College is, is one of our validators alongside various other mostly funds. These are the people who secure the blockchain network. They're the ones who are processing the transactions and putting up collateral. So they earn the fees in return for providing the service to the network. And by decentralizing your network, you essentially are moving yourself into a regulatory compliant category because there's no central party under sort of securities regulation. Um, and it allows you to really kind of scale this thing up and let it be open source. So right now, the Aventus network um, has a majority of its network participants with third parties um, sort of in line with that decentralized vision. It also helps the security aspects of the network. Some of those hacks I referred to previously were because too much control in the network sat with one party. So you compromise one party, the whole network goes down. In our case, for example, you would have to compromise at least seven or eight different parties to really be able to compromise the security of a network. I'm not going to bore you too much with the details here, but it's around governance, right? It's important to set up the regulatory structures. We put a lot of work into setting up the Aventus Foundation. We did this in Jersey Channel Islands because the regulators there have just moved faster than the FCA or the SEC in 2017. No regulator, FCA or SEC, had any guidance on this. 
whereas in smaller jurisdictions that are used to sort of more cutting edge financial applications, you have the ability to work with the regulator, build the right structures in a compliant manner with top class regulators, regulated entities, non-executive directors, all of that. And then another important aspect is watching uh, across the sort of key jurisdictions globally, how tokens evolve. Obviously, the, the frameworks for these things are changing all the time. I think China has banned and unbanned crypto about seven times. Uh, India has been similar. They've been back or forth where they stand on it. The SEC is moving all over. Is this a Security and Exchange Commission uh, obligation? Is it the commodities board, uh, regulator that regulates tokens? All the way around, you have to kind of keep an eye on this and make sure that legal work is up to date when you're dealing with corporates. So it's not the exciting part of the business, but it is an important hygiene factor to make sure nothing goes wrong. And then, as I mentioned around security, right, anybody who's uh, sort of involved in development or knows development should know most of these things, basic security, disaster recovery processes, all of the good stuff that makes sure that uh, you don't end up in trouble. So let me skip through these next few so that we can get to what I believe will be the most interesting here, which is around use cases. So use case number one, NFT. So NFT stands for non-fungible token. For those of you who haven't seen it, it's essentially um, the notion of fungibility is if you look at tokens, each individual unit, are they distinguishable from each other or not distinguishable from each other? So if you have any two pound notes or pound coins, they're pretty much the same, right? These are fungible with respect to each other. I can pay you if I've got two pound coins, you don't, and I owe you a pound, you don't mind which pound I pay you with. These, these, these items are fungible. That it doesn't make a difference. Every item is the same. When you talk about non-fungible, you're saying that every item is fundamentally different. And that's really what we're talking about. It's tokens in a crypto sense. It's this digital scarcity we've created, but we're looking at non-fungible use cases. So where this applies is the art world. Every painting is obviously different. Every image is different. Um, and various other elements like that. If you consider data sets, for example, this is something, a newer area of NFTs. Each data set as it evolves over time uh, is slightly different. So, well, as long as it's an evolving data set. So that's what an NFT is fundamentally. So what we've done, we've built a business where we have uh, various use cases. Um, the NFT market started, uh, I'd say, about a year and a half ago is when it really got hot. And what people started off with is they understood this notion of commodity, right? The first pillar is commodity. You have this scarce resource where you can now represent images. And people sold a bunch of pictures for really high amounts. I mean, there was a Beeple uh, image sold for $69 million at auction. It was a lot of money, but it was early high. And there wasn't actually any fundamental utility to what was being sold. So as the market evolves, people became clearer and, okay, actually, this is really about community as sort of the second key pillar. And when you look at community, I think one of the most interesting use cases to look at is a project called Board API Club. What this is, is computer-generated art. They generate pictures of monkeys, right? The 10,000 monkeys, and each of them have different properties. So some monkeys have an earring, some are smoking a pipe whatever, right? The colors are different. The properties of the monkeys are different. And there's a different probability of each of these being achieved. 2% of the monkeys have earrings. 10% of the monkeys wear shades, whatever it is. <coughs> these NFTs on average have sold for 450,000 per NFT. So a really high amount for a picture of a monkey. And what they did so nicely in this community, and what, what they did so nicely is generate community, an engaged audience, that helps with the curation, that gets access to the membership benefits. It's really a members club where they get exclusive access. What they did on top of the NFTs is generate an FT, a fungible token, or just a token as people refer to them. Um, the Board Ape Yacht Club, which is essentially the governance coin, which allows the community to participate in votes or whatnot in this ecosystem. Now, that governance coin is worth $7 billion today, which is a huge amount for this ecosystem. Now, this is very much a tech-driven ecosystem. It's not super enterprise grade. They've done some great collaborations, but it's early stages. And one of the best examples of how community has been done well 
over the last three or four months, the blockchain industry has dropped maybe 75% in market cap on average. This board ape community dropped three to 5%. So that really shows you that these people have understood something about fundamental utility, their community is strong, and really it becomes digital marketing strategy where people are using TikTok or Instagram as a channel. I believe Instagram, I believe NFTs right now are just another string to your bow, if you might, in that digital marketing channel, a way to engage a particular audience, specifically a sort of 18 to 40 demographic is very heavily represented within that community. So that's where we've seen the most interesting use cases. We've done deals with people in sport and film and music, um, really looking at how we can help them with that kind of a digital marketing strategy. Then the next one is video games. So here, a business came to me called Fruit Lab. They're a social media platform that focuses on content generated around video games and giving people a great experience around video games. And what they wanted to do is find a way to get involved in the, should we say, play to earn economy that, that's really emerging in the video game space, especially in crypto. So where users playing actually earn rewards that have real world value. So a lot in video games that has evolved over the last years is these in-game upsells, right? You can buy a skin, you can buy a gun, you can buy a football, whatever, right? You can buy all kinds of different stuff within the game on a kind of microtransaction basis. What we built for Fruit Lab was a coin which would allow, align the economic incentives of the users. So as you create content and generate content, the more your content's up like, the more tokens you earn. The more it's shared, the more engagement you create, the more viewing, the more tokens you earn. You're also able to compete head to head with these tokens. Now, this is a game of skill, not a game of chance. So it doesn't fall into any of the sort of gambling categorization. Um, and now we have managed to roll this out with them. They've got all, a bunch of the triple A titles, which is the top tier of video games. So they have integrations with Fortnite and um, I don't know video games very well, but the top video games are, are now able to play this against each other. Um, and that's a really interesting ecosystem we've seen growing. There are over 600,000 users actively engaged in this community now, just helped them close out another $2 million round in financing just based off the token alone. So it's a really growing ecosystem. That's an interesting application for, uh, for blockchain in general. Another use case we have built out is aviation. So the fundamental premise here is we obviously have significant supply chain inflation at the moment, right? This is for a variety of factors. COVID certainly hasn't helped. It led um, airlines to shut down for a long time, lose out on a lot of revenue. They're really on the ropes in that respect. There are all sorts of additional checks and stuff that now have to occur, which increases time, increases spend. So all around the aviation sector is hungry for operational efficiency, a reduction in their cost base. So we started working with Heathrow Airport and a, and a national airline. We did a deal to explore on an R&D basis how we can solve this. And now we're rolling it out to the wider industry. And really the problem that we identified was around the ULDs. So ULD stands for Uniform Loading Device. This is essentially the cargo containers that people put into planes and you put mail or baggage or whatever else cargo within these containers and they move around the world. At any point in time, 5% of these containers um, are lost. There's a lot of manual paper entry um, at the airports. There's all kinds of confusion as to why these things go missing and that costs a lot of money. They also cause great delays in flights. If the cargo has a load, if they can't find one of these things, there's guaranteed to be a delayed flight somewhere. So we came in looking at a solution that can really help unify the existing systems they have, but also create a reward mechanism for their staff where the better a baggage handler does his job, as in the more times he accurately identifies where a ULB is, the more royal, loyalty point they essentially reward point that that user gets. And at the end of the month, they're compensated for that through whatever, intangibles, or ultimately we'll plug this into the aviation loyalty schemes where they'll be able to earn miles for doing a good job. So that's the structure of that, incentivizing the baggage handlers to perform more accurate data input, but also creating a sort of unifying backbone across the various different systems for interoperability so that it's easier to move these uniform loading devices across the different systems. 
Then another use case we have is in royalty. So this one, uh, the CEO of Cashback Up came to me and it's a cashback scheme, right? So, so the basic business model of a cashback scheme is you have a guy who sits in the middle of a cashback operator. They'll sign up businesses who offer 5% cashback to anybody who buys in their business. The reason the business will do this is because the cashback operator has a bunch of clients. So it means more sales, but those sales at slightly lower margins. A user will obviously join it because they're shopping in these merchants anyway, and they want to you know, get some cash back, get a discount. Now, the problem with this scheme is there are a few different ones. There's an issue around user experience. So because of traditional banking infrastructure, it takes time to settle transactions between the various different merchants and users. And on a microtransaction basis, it doesn't really work. It's very difficult to say, I got 5% cash back on my $1 coffee. I've got five cents now. I want to go spend that in McDonald's. But traditional banking infrastructure isn't really set up for that. The fees and the delays don't really allow you to do that easily. So one is a microtransaction user experience benefit where you don't now have to make your customer wait until they have $100 before they cash out. They can use their balance immediately. They can sell it on the secondary market. They can respend it. All of that infrastructure works much faster. The second issue is more of a business one around the balance sheet debt obligation that is a loyalty point. You have obviously an obligation to honor all the cash back that your clients have racked up from merchants. Some merchants go out of business or go bankrupt. There's timing delays. There's all kinds of issues around moving that money around, but you're sitting with this balance sheet debt obligation. So we managed to build a two token model across sort of stable discount loyalty vouchers and an overall governance coin, which kind of takes up the slack. So anytime a discount voucher deviates from par, if you think of it in terms of a pegged currency, anytime it deviates from par, you either expand or contract the supply of the overall coin to take up that delta in value. So this means you create a stable peg. It also means you don't have to honor the full balance sheet debt obligation. The free market and the promise of merchants reacceptance collateralizes this system. So it's a new way, a much more efficient financial way of operating loyalty schemes. Event ticketing, I've already run you through, so I'll do this one quickly. It's just looking at a ticket delivery solution. The market artificially prices tickets below equilibrium price, right? So if a ticket's really someone would pay 75, people are pricing it at 50. It's for a variety of reasons, deal with the artists, deal with the promoters, the venues, whatever. They want a sold out show, they need to recoup quickly. But when you see what happens in market, you actually have bots sitting there. So when Beyonce goes on sale on Ticketmaster, there'll be a bunch of automated computer programs sitting there trying to buy up these tickets and sell them on secondary market sites, which are not controlled by the people doing the sale for higher prices. Then the minute you buy it on the secondary market price, they check out on the primary market and they've just arbitraged you and they take that delta. Now, the problem the industry has is they don't get a share of that but they still have to price tickets lower. So the solution we created allows them to completely control and regulate this market so that they can only sell at the specific price. You bind the identity to a ticket, essentially creating a non-fungible token out of that ticket. And then you open up secondary market trading later on where when those, those things transfer, you can always charge a secondary market fee on that because the blockchain gives you full transparency into where that moves around and whatnot. So that's the key value add that we've looked at around that use case. And then finally, this is one of our most recent use cases of blockchain as a service. There are various people who want to run their own blockchain networks. Now, this is still a small but growing market. So we did a deal with the founders of Paddy Power, which is a betting company, um, who've started a new venture called ASX Sports. So this is their essentially think fantasy football type model. And um, they've done a deal with rugby so far. So they have the rights for UK rugby, I believe it is. Um, or maybe it's Irish rugby. It's a bunch of Irish guys. Um, and they are now looking at essentially letting you buy players as NFTs, trade those NFTs and earn reward tokens as part of that. So we deployed them a private version of the public eventus network within their ecosystem. So rugby can run one node, American football can run one validator, and all of their network participants can come to consensus. The reason somebody would want to do this is, it's like that intranet, internet example I gave. You want to have control of your ecosystem so you can protect against money laundering, against any of the sort of fraudulent activity. So you control your validators, 
but you still have a connection into the public world of public blockchain so you can leverage that value in the community and the should we say the assets and value that sit outside of your particular site. So anyway, I hope that was interesting in terms of some of our use cases. I am going to stop there and we make this a bit more dynamic around some QA. Okay, that's great. Uh, th thank you, Alan. Do you want to brilliant? Thank you for that. So uh, that was fascinating. And I think, yeah, for me, actually, <clears throat> you, you gave some great insight into new business models. Yeah, not, not, and it's, as you kind of, I think, emphasized, it's not just about the technology, it's seeing the business applications and, yeah, maybe uh, making best use of some of the uniqueness of blockchain for those business applications. Uh, you know, the one that struck me, actually, the container management one, that's such an obvious one, but the angle you mentioned about, incentivizing people uh, around actually updating information uh, because they can benefit from doing it. I, that, was, that was interesting. And, uh, and I, I, we now have a, a new acronym or initialism, a, a ULD. We didn't know that one before. So, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that one either. I needed some learning there. And your point is really, it's a really important one of finding where this technology fits, fits best. Because if you see in the early days, or at least over the last few years, a lot of people through applications that didn't work well at blockchain and you see the oh. conversion rates between proof of concepts with enterprises into multi-year contracts is incredibly low it's increasing but it's really low which shows people are looking for a nice press release around blockchain oh. but there isn't actually fundamental utility around that use case so that's what oh. we're hoping to try and find the right use cases well yeah, that's interesting well that actually be quite nice to go back to some of those original promises and see which ones did land and which ones didn't. So, uh, yeah, I think di diamonds and land registry, if I, if I remember well from a while back. But, uh, okay, that's great. So we, we got quite a few questions, actually, which is, yeah, tremendous. So um, I, I think the first question actually relates to what we talked about uh, before opening the call around, um, uh, yeah, the changes in some of the underlying technology in the platforms. And you, you mentioned the... Yeah, the issues around sustainability of current you know, Bitcoin blockchain technologies. And uh, I think the, the stats are that kind of Bitcoin is taking the, the same power consumption as countries like Finland and the Netherlands at the moment. So that, that's clearly not sustainable. And um, we've got a, a question from David Hyde. Um, so David, if you want to put your camera on and... Uh, ask the question happy for you to do so or i'll um i'll ask it on your behalf you should be able to unmute yourself yeah yeah hi um no i'm happy for you just to read it out as i've written it oh, okay there. right there we go so 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 alan david's question is why, why is the aventus uh, layer two blockchain moving from ethereum layer one to polka dot layer two layer uh, one uh, layer one given the yeah the ethereum switch between uh proof of work and proof of stake? Yeah, so there's a few different levels to tackle this one on. Um, first of all, Ethereum has the biggest ecosystem, right? But it's moving quite slowly and it has to because it's such a big ecosystem. It's been sort of six years in the making of uh, doing this transition to the current system. Vitalik conceptualized this proof of stake model early on. And even with the Ethereum 2.0 merge that's happened in the last, whatever, 24 hours, there's still a long way to go before Ethereum really realizes its vision of the various different shards, because it's, it's supposed to now essentially split into 64 chains that all talk to each other, right? So Polkadot is there today with its infrastructure, with the Polkadot infrastructure around its parachain and its cross-chain messaging, which they've recently launched. If you become a parachain, which Aventus has just become, you're able to talk to all of the other chains. And fundamentally, the design is different. Polkadot is a layer zero blockchain in that Polkadot itself doesn't have any functionality beyond the core blockchain usage, right? It's got consensus mechanisms. It's got messaging protocols. It's got all the stuff that's typically in common between blockchain use cases, but it gets out of the way when it comes to specific um, business logic. So the nice thing with that design is 
you can build a chain that's much more focused on an individual use case. And if you look at blockchain transactions, 70 to 80% of blockchain traffic is generic token transactions. The general purpose stuff that generates from gen that benefits from general purpose smart contracts is the minority of blockchain transactions on Ethereum. So going specific use case per shard, should we call it, but each one having different usage. So each parachain Aventus has certain use case. Moonbeam has all of Ethereum's functionality, so that's general purpose. Centrifuge has decentralized finance. So you have all of these different systems that can talk to each other securely, which you can't do out of the Ethereum ecosystem. Any bridge has an inherent vulnerability, but whilst maintaining the ability for that bridging to come into the Polkadot ecosystem, I find allows for the best trade-off between performance and specific use case functionality, but still allowing to leverage the, the kind of benefits from the wider ecosystem. So that's why we moved from deriving our security from Ethereum whilst maintaining the bi-directional asset flow to deriving our security from Polkadot. It's also the, one of the most green blockchains that's been running in production in that state for a long time. And Ethereum is still going to take probably a year to get to that state. Um, so that's that's really what motivated our move. Um, and also we have a close relationship now with the Polkadot Parity, which is the, the, the commercial arm and the Web3 Foundation. Um, and, and obviously Gavin Wood, who co-founded Ethereum and was the CTO, did most of the technical design and then did this. He's kind of innovated this to the next level in a foster manner. And it's great to be in that ecosystem where some of the, the, the sort of key thinking is, is still being driven from. Mm. Could, could you maybe just, uh, for, for those of us who are kind of still getting up to speed with the jargon, say in a few words, well, what proof of work and proof of stake are and you know, the pros and cons of each? Yeah, so proof of work was the original consensus mechanism that launched with Bitcoin. And it's a very elegant way, well, it's something we've never sort of done before properly to create that digital scarcity where you essentially have people compete to solve a problem. Um, everybody, every time a block gets created, there's a new problem that everybody has to compete to solve. Whoever solves that problem first gets to say what the next block is. So this is the way where you have a bunch of different people without a central authority agreeing on what the transaction ordering is, because we can see all the transactions, who gets to decide which transaction happens when. That's what these consensus algorithms solve. So proof of work does that where essentially the more energy you burn, the more, the more processing power you contribute, the higher your probability of solving that problem first and therefore being allowed to decide what the next block is. And every person who creates a block gets paid for creating a block. So that's your kind of incentive. Now, proof of stake, the objective is to achieve the same an ordering of transactions without a central party. But the way you go about that is not based on computational resource, so energy consumption, but it's based on economic game theory. So everybody, the more you put up at risk, the more you stake, so the more of a token that you put in a bucket in the custody of the blockchain, the higher your probability is of being randomly selected. So you're essentially creating a probability distribution out of people's stake, my amount of stake divided by the total network stake is my probability of being selected, and that probability function is what determines who gets to create the next block, not based on energy consumption. In a simple terms, that's the difference between the two. So you can see why proof of stake would be much more energy efficient because there's no processing. The processing is constant. It's randomly selecting and sampling a distribution rather than burning energy to prove who wins every single time. Okay, thank, thanks for that. I there's obviously follow on questions to that and people may want to ask yeah but we'll uh, uh rob williams has got a good one here about it seems that chains are getting longer and longer and as time goes on yeah, is there fundamentally a technical issue with yeah, storage filling up so yeah this is an an important one to consider especially with how much history do we have right we've seen over time how that can impact security you've obviously got data from security standards of 10 years ago now what happens in the next 100 years if these systems keep fleshing out so not only do you have more data you have more data that is potentially vulnerable to compromise if there is sensitive information that is within the system um, the size itself there are various 
ways people are looking at addressing this problem. So there is no requirement for every single party to store a full history, right? You can, we have distributed data stores today already, if you think of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing systems, right? There's the ability to make sure that not every single person, now not all blockchains implement this yet, many of them still, every single person has to have the full copy of everything, but these more evolved models of data storage are coming to be. Also, if you look at the evolution, um, I think it's Moore's law, right, from, from Intel, the rate at which our processing power is increasing. Essentially, you can look at it, the size of, of, of computing technology is halving every 18 months. I know it's slowed a little bit. But we're still to a degree in an exponential of our evolving capabilities in terms of storage size and processing power. So at this point, blockchains are not growing at the rate that our advancement in technology is happening. But at some point that might change and we'll have to distribute these storage systems. So it's a potential problem, but right now they're, they're much greater uh, sort of issues that need to be addressed before that. It's not a real problem until we bump up against that limit. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, the, uh, Alan, I don't know which Alan, but Alan to uh, talked about, yeah, the, the proof of stake. Uh, as you mentioned, yeah, you can lose your stake. So yeah, there implies that there's some, there is some overall authority, some governance, which makes that happen. That's true, but the overall authority is the blockchain network itself. All of the rules by which you would lose your stake are automatically enforced by the smart contracts that sit within that blockchain ecosystem. So, for example, if I randomly sample the distribution and it's your turn to mine the block and your computer switched off at that time, the system will automatically penalize you and take your stake away because you have a certain uptime guarantee to the network you have to provide. It doesn't happen that harshly immediately. You get two or three turns, but you have to provide an 80% uptime guarantee. Otherwise, there's issues. So everything, there's no, oh, people can just vote on it or, oh, there's some kind of board that can say, I'm taking your stake away now. It's all automated processes that are self-enforced by the blockchain ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, brilliant. Thank you for that. It, you used the the term smart contracts just then and and before and when you talked to us. And it's one of these things that's always puzzled me because I, I kind of work with a lot of lawyers and, and lawyers latch on to smart contracts because they, they hear, hear the word contract. Firstly, they think uh, there's money to be made for lawyers. Uh, and then they think uh, they are legally enforceable. And when, when I look at them, to my mind, they're some form of stored procedure. So I just wondered, yeah, yeah what's the yeah, demystify the legal significance of a smart contract? Yeah, so I think smart contract, it's a nice name, it's a catchy name, but it's not a legal contract. It's not right. what it is, is code. It's essentially a computer program. You can think of it as a script, right? <laughs> that executes at a certain location on the blockchain. So when you interact with that address, the smart contract address, you can access the functionality that has been deployed there. Everybody can see transparently what that functionality is. You can choose if you want to use it or not. But yeah, it's not, yeah. It's not a legal agreement. What you can do is set up computer code to enforce legal agreements, right? So if a legal agreement is you have to pay me this on this day, otherwise there's a 5% penalty in the future, you can make code represent those same contractual clauses, but it's not a contractual obligation and there's no court in this world that is enforcing smart contract. Yeah, yeah I'm glad to hear that. And I, I need your help when I'm talking to the lawyers next time on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Peter, Peter Michael, you've uh, asked the question about the link really from the uh, from the, the virtual crypto world into the physical world. So it says, how does the net remain linked to a physical object? So this is really important. I think NFTs only really work well today with digital assets, right? So I spoke about films, music, all of these digital assets, it works the best for. When we start getting to a physical digital link, that's where it becomes quite difficult. And it, the, the, the problem there is on proving that link much more so than the NFT functionality itself. So if you think of an NFT, it basically is an ownership record call it an IP licensing agreement with a link 
an identifier of the asset it's referring to. Now, digital assets you can create hashes out of, which are essentially fingerprints. So it's very easy to say there is the first claim on this fingerprint that ever exists with these kind of a system. What's not so easy is to say, okay, I've created a fingerprint of this real world asset. How do you, so if you put that on the real world asset as a barcode, you can obviously fake that barcode and stick it on a different Gucci bag or whatever it is you're trying to claim the provenance of, right? So that becomes a problem of creating tamper-proof systems. Now I've seen some cool stuff. There's some fruit in Indonesia. I can't remember, it's, a, it's this disgusting fruit, dried and smelly or whatever, right? It's a, it's a local thing in that market. And you're able to wrap this cloth around it whilst it's growing with a certain identifier on it. And when it grows, you can't take that cloth out without damaging the system. I was chatting to some guy this week on this NFT use case. So there are, in certain circumstances, nice ways where you can create that physical digital link. Um, but that's a whole challenge and, and that's a hardware problem in and of itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I think, uh, Alan, again, go, going back, uh, favorite topic about containers, it seems. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, you mentioned the problem was container companies buying and selling uh, each other. So he says, have you encountered that? So I guess that's a. So I think this is some of the difficulty, right? There's so many, when you're talking about logistics, you're talking global always, right? Because it's different countries sending each other stuff. And everybody uses different tech systems. Everybody uses different providers. Now you have a couple of guys like Donato or Swissport who potentially run 50% of the world's trade. So you can get good buckets. But ultimately, yes, it's, it's, it's a challenge with evolving markets. The thing is the tech hasn't really caught up. So most of these systems, people are using systems from the 80s or 90s. It was good enough. There's still a lot of paperwork. So to a degree, it's a leapfrogging effort of actually getting people onto digital systems. And that's why the important part here that I mentioned is the incentivization of the people inputting this data because your data is only as good as somebody who actually puts it in. Otherwise, yeah. we're talking about installing Bluetooth, even, even at Heathrow, right? The use case we're looking at, they've got Bluetooth sensors all over the airport, but the range doesn't work well or there's interference or there's whatever. So you can say it's in terminal one, but there's a lot of places in terminal one that this ULB might be stored. So mm -hmm. yes, it's a problem, but the, the material problems are more around uh, these elements. Yeah, but actually thinking about it, if, if, if you kind of go back to basics, if, if your technology is improving the asset management of these containers, then yeah, if, if company A buys company B, uh, yeah, there's a, there's an argument to say you've got a better a better asset register in the first place. You actually know what you're buying. Exactly. If provenance, this is a, a use case in India we've seen, right? If you can prove the provenance of peanuts, they trade at a twenty percent premium on the market. It's that exact kind of a premise, right? It's mm. provenance mm. leading to mitigation of risk and therefore even lower debt financing, which you can bring into these equations. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um. I think uh, there's two final questions. I think we've just about got time to squeeze them in. Slightly long questions. So uh, will the blockchain eventually lead to a winner takes all industry structure in the same way as Web2 uh, has and Facebook? Or does it result in many blockchain platforms working together uh, rather than a mega? So I guess your, your, your pitch on interoperability kind of plays into that. Yeah, so I would like to see a world where you could have all of these silo pockets of value, but the nature of our sort of capitalist markets and the flow of capital is that consolidation occurs, right? So mm -hmm. if I had to guess, I would say I would expect this market to consolidate as well around two or three major players. Let's look at cloud computing, for example, right? There are loads of different cloud providers, but they've essentially congregated around two or three major ones, AWS, Microsoft Azure, or whatever, right? So I think blockchain will be similar, but there will be a few different ones and you'll still need communication between each of them. The thing is, how do you know who these players will be? That's where the interoperability point remains relevant no matter what. You want to have a quick and easy migration path from your blockchain, if it is a dying ecosystem, into the one that is vibrant. So I think it's important to have the infrastructure to keep the flexibility, but long term, I expect there will be three or four major market players and then Five percent of the market will be taken up by a hundred, something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And Jim, Jim Wheeler, finally, back in 
1935 trying to solve the problem of in, incentivizing the correct and timely input of data into a database sort of failed because of lack of rewards so i think he's kind of yeah playing back the sort of i think his point was that the emperor the emperor's new clothes come come into mind so uh he's just kind of recognizing that what you're doing yeah actually incentivizing people participants uh to to do the right stuff is uh is uh, is great so i think we've pretty close to coming uh, out of time so i'd like to thank you alan for a, a great talk and uh and thank you for remembering us i think you said that uh told me the other day that uh, when you gave the talk to friends last time uh you actually uh, made contact with somebody who you're now working with so yes uh, so that, well, that was interesting <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's always great coming back to anything associated with Imperial, trying to share some of the knowledge and see if the interesting conversations to be had. So yeah, thank great, you for having me. Fun. So uh, with, with that, we have uh, Professor David Southwood is now unmuted on video. So I'd like to ask David if you could uh, just wrap up discussion and uh, take it from there. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Bill. And thank you very much, Alan a very stimulating session. I uh, think uh, you've got a very good turnout actually for a fireside chat. Uh, and um, so I'd like to thank you. Um, and uh, possibly people could unmute and clap, but I think there's a facility somewhere down below you can use. Uh, so please think, see yourself as uh, receiving applause. Um, Thank you.